welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening for the fifth week of our Commit to Fit Wellness Speaker Series. This series is made possible with a grant from the California State Library and funds from the Wood Friends of the Woodland Public Library. In addition to the Wednesday evening speaker series, we also meet at Douglas Park from 9 to 10 a.m. on Saturday mornings through the end of March for a community walk. If you would like to learn more about edible landscaping and vegetable gardening after hearing Don Shore's presentation, please take a look at the library's collection of books on these subjects. Tonight, we are very pleased to have Don Shore here to talk about easy edibles in your garden. Don Shore grew up in San Diego and is a graduate of the University of California, Davis in plant science. Having a lifelong interest in gardening, Don opened the Redwood Barn Nursery in Davis in 1981. He is a certified <coughs> nursery professional and landscape contractor. He writes a monthly column for the Davis Enterprise and conducts a weekly garden show on KDRT 95.7 FM in Davis on Thursdays at noon. Don lives on a farm outside of Dixon, raising almonds, walnuts, and pecans. He has served for over a decade on the State Nursery Association Board of Directors and is the editor of Bamboo, the magazine of the American Bamboo Society since 2005. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Don Shaw. See if I can project without the microphone. Everybody hear me? If I mumble, just raise your hand. This picture actually was taken right near my farm outside of Dixon. I live on 13 acres in Solano County. We have almonds and walnuts and pecans, and this is a view from Pedrick uh, Road, which is not far from where I live. So it's all walnut tree now, I'm sorry to say. Uh, I want to focus this evening on easy edibles. That's the topic, and so there will be some things that won't be in this conversation because some of them are harder to grow. But if there's something missing, we can certainly talk about it. I've tried to leave plenty of time for questions, either as we go along or periodically through the pot. This is a harvest on my kitchen table in the month of December. And these are all things I picked up from around my farm or in my very large garden as, as part of that property. Pecan, I'm very grateful to the woman who planted the pecan tree on the property in the 1930s. I get about 100 pounds of pecans off of it every year. The position for picking up pecans is uncomfortable. I need my kids to have children, so they can do that for me now. Um, these are Awari Satsuma mandarins behind them, a couple of Hachia persimmons, a leftover uh, squash from the vegetable garden, and a sort of some peppers still producing here in December. My daughter has moved to Brooklyn, and I love to send her these pictures in December because <laughs> back there, as she said to me the other day, Dad, yeah, nobody moves here for the weather. <laughs> this is more of an October picture, and I like it because it shows something that I'm going to come back to later. Some of these are easy plants like tomatillos. I've only ever planted tomatillos intentionally once in my vegetable garden. Yeah, I'm in your way. That's okay. Okay. I, they will receive themselves to the point of becoming, we like to call it naturalized in the nursery business. You can call them weeds if you prefer. The basket of tomatoes I picked from one plant, sweet carneros pink. The reason I show it is it's a fairly small fruit. And one of your takeaway points from this is smaller fruited tomatoes are easier, more productive than bigger fruited, all other things considered. Peppers ripen in your garden late in the season. This was an October picture. So rich, red, ripe peppers are something you just have to wait for. It's just a matter of being patient for those. And there's a whole lot of new tomatoes that have come on the market. We'll talk more about tomatoes, but this is a basket picked in one morning from some of the wild boar farms tomatoes. There's a new series that have been introduced, open pollinated, organically grown, all kinds of cool and interesting colors, and very productive because the guy who's developing them is right here in the valley. So these are good for our region. So I just wanted to show you some harvest baskets to get your appetite whetted. I don't expect you to be able to read this, but it is on my website, redwoodfarm.com. 
But it, it is something that's called a harvest chart, and you'll find if any of you have your phones with you, you can pull it up. It's right there on the home page, harvest chart. These are by month. January, February, March, April, May, June is a similar one for the other half of the year. We live in an amazing region. I grew up in San Diego, as she said, in coastal San Diego, right near UCSD. I was able to grow far more things than my father can grow mm -hmm. down there, having moved here to the valley. These are things you can be harvesting. The yellow part is citrus. So we have citrus varieties we can harvest every month of the year. It does go all the way through the summer. <coughs> These are the vegetables. And about May, we hit the deciduous things, the fruit trees and vines, because we have enough chilling in the winter for the deciduous plants to do well here. So you literally can, with some planning, pick something out of your garden every month of the year. And I want to focus on the ones that are easier to grow. Here's the other half of the year. By July, we're very heavy on peaches and pears and things like that, all the way back to December. So there is something out in the garden every month if you plan ahead a little bit. Now, I don't expect you're all going to do this. <laughs> the front yard in Quebec, of all places. This picture has become very famous in the nursery circles and horticultural circles because these people were taken to court by their neighbors for having a vegetable garden in their front yard. And they fought City Hall and won. The mayor is still here? <laughs> <laughs> so they have a beautiful, well-organized, highly intensive vegetable garden in their front yard. They're producing food where otherwise they would typically have a lawn or ground cover. Now this has become an issue in some areas. I don't think it's a case of Woodland or particularly in Davis, but Sacramento went through this. A garden in the front is a nuisance. And if a neighbor complains, they have to abate it. They have to tell you to take it out. There's, this is becoming gradually, bit by bit, homeowners associations are dropping those rules as people go more and more into home landscaping. Way at the other end of the spectrum, this may be all you want to do. This is a bowl of old basil. This is what my daughter wants to do in her third story apartment in Brooklyn. And it's a real challenge to have much edible there. Five different kinds of basil crammed together in a bowl. I will say this is a great thing to do if your expectations for long harvest are not real high. You'll be cooking from this for about eight weeks, and at that point it'll be so root bound that probably you'll want to start over. That's fine. Dump it out, start over, get some more fresh basil. And I'll come back to basil because it's really an easy one to do. So I wrote a column for the Enterprise last month on my most flavorful fruit, and it was one of those my top 12 most flavorful fruit. You can go to redwoodbar.com. I have a link to the Davis Enterprise article. And I find that people like that format. So I'm going to start with 12 of what I consider to be probably the easiest food plants you can grow in your garden here in the valley that you might actually eat. I mean, prickly pears are easy to grow, and some people eat them, but probably not most of you, so they're not on this list. Oops. So oh, there's the article. That's right. Uh, if you go to my website, that's the one I was talking about, about flavorful fruit. So that's the regular garden website. Meyer lemon. There's a reason that Meyer lemon is by far the most popular citrus. It flowers off and on all year at different times of year. It can set fruit at different times of year. So you can have ripe fruit on your Meyer lemon year round. It's not a true lemon. Lemon purists will prefer Eureka or Elizabeth. It's considered to be a cross between a lemon and a mandarin, but it has wonderful sweet tart fruit year round. So very easy. Meyer lemon. Meyer. Okay. This is the Washington Naval Orange. It's the same woman who planted the pecan on my property, thought they planted one of these for us in the 1950s. We get about 100 to 200 naval oranges every winter from about January through April. We do almost nothing for this tree. I water it once a month, very thoroughly. I remember feeding it a few years ago. I don't think I've fed it since. I prune it to keep it from getting too big. I try to remember to pick the fruit before it falls on the ground. But it's very thoughtful and it hangs on the tree real well. So citrus are actually pretty low input, and we'll talk more about citrus. But the Washington Naval is one that doesn't come up on lists a lot because we're so familiar with it. It's really one of the best citrus for the valley. You might be surprised to see strawberries on a list of easy to grow. They're easy for you to grow in your garden. They're not the easiest agricultural crop. They are, in fact, the most intensively sprayed agricultural crop in the state of California. More pesticides are used on them per acre than almost anything else I can think of. But in your backyard, you don't have to do all that. I have a customer who's an attorney who has a four-year-old daughter who loves strawberries. He's not an avid gardener, but he likes to cut them in the garden. Every time he comes in, he picks up a little six-pack of strawberries from me, preferably in bloom, because he knows that bloom will be a fruit in six weeks. So almost nothing can go wrong with him getting from fruit, from flower to fruit, within at least that six-week period. But I went to his house at one point, and he had stuck some of them in a pot of cactus. Somewhere under the roses, somewhere in the shade, somewhere in the sun. We just planted them wherever we felt like planting them. And at any given time, this four year old went out the door, she could plant a strawberry out in the garden. If that's your expectation, strawberries are very easy to grow. 
you're growing them for production, if you want this kind of quantity, we'll have to talk about crop protection from birds and things like that. But just a few amount in the garden can be planted almost any time of year to give fruit just a few weeks later. Radishes. Whenever I work with schools, I strongly recommend they plant some radish seeds as soon as the project garden area is built and designed because they'll be producing in about six weeks. You can't really go wrong with radishes. If you don't happen to like radishes, I don't really recommend it, but for kids, they're a great project. They can go out and pull up <coughs> colorful their radishes and they'll be eating six to eight weeks later, sometimes sooner. This is my Santa Rosa plum. It's not my absolute top favorite plum. It's good. It's got real rich flavor and kind of a tart skin, but this is what it does every year. And you can get this in your yard without doing much of anything. Santa Rosa and other plums are probably what I would call the best beginner's fruit trees of all, because they'll produce almost no matter what. I do the radio show with Lois Richter, who has a, a, a plum in a lot of shade, and it still produces more than she knows what to do with it. I don't recommend shade for them, but it does okay. And the only drawback to it, I mentioned I don't want things that are real messy, if you don't pick these, they're all over the ground, so you have to do something with them pretty quick. And there's other plums that are better in that regard. The Santa Rosa plum is an absolutely foolproof fruit tree. Of all the range of tomatoes, and I have over 150 varieties available to me from my different bedding plant vendors, um, the smaller fruited ones are going to be the most reliable. For even beginning gardeners, they're going to produce almost no matter what. They don't take as long to ripen. Fewer things can go wrong. And this little one is called Juliet. Juliet is a phenomenal producer that does well in quite a wide range of conditions. And great feedback on Juliet tomato. It actually cooks well as well as being for fresh eating. Of the peppers that I sell, the Gypsy pepper is one of the most reliable, produces heavily under almost any circumstance. And I just wanted to show this for another reason. Gypsy also ripens very quickly. Uh, every pepper you plant will turn red if you give it long enough. Most of us are eating our peppers when they're green. That's why we don't ever see rich red ripe peppers in the garden. You have to wait typically till September or October for green pepper to turn red. Gypsy will do it by July. And so it will give you ripe pepper very quickly. Is that uh, sweet? It's a sweet pepper, yeah. yeah. Uh, hot peppers are easy to grow, but I figured sweet peppers have a broader range. Sweet basil. Now, my daughter, who is not a plant person, has failed with basil several times in her third story apartment in Brooklyn. But she keeps trying, and I, I give her credit for that. It's not an indoor plant. You really shouldn't try and grow basil as a house plant. That's her problem. She's on the third story of a, of a brownstone. But in the garden here in Sacramento Valley, it's one of the easiest things to grow. It produces in a matter of four to six weeks from seed. You can keep cutting it back, and it flushes with growth all summer long. It's very, probably one of the simplest herbs that we can grow. And this is really herb country, and I will return to this. Um, one of the Spice Islands had a production facility outside of Brooklyn for quite a while. I don't know if it's still there. But they were growing rosemary and some of the cooking herbs outside of Dixon because the valley heat is great for herbs. Figs. There are some 80-year-old figs on my property that produce thousands of fruit that mostly I can't even get to, but a lot of it does get eaten, and they never even get irrigated. So figs are one of the toughest, most drought-tolerant, most reliable trees you can grow in this area. And pomegranates, and once you figure out what to do with them, are spectacular and wonderful <laughs> things to grow. I have a, about 12 feet by 12 feet. I water it once a month during the summer. It produces 100 to 150 fruit or more every summer. And finally, two summers ago, my son went out and found one of those old metal orange juicers that they used to use in the 1930s. And by the way, put down plastic before you do this. And you cut it in half and you can juice And He got about a gallon and a half of pomegranate juice, which is one of the most amazing substances known to man. Very, very good for you, very powerfully flavored. Now that we know what to do with them, we'll find the pomegranate even more useful. But they're beautiful. They have beautiful flowers in the spring, great fruit in the fall. If you don't eat them, squirrels or the, the cedar waxwing will enjoy them. Swiss chard. I don't know how much Swiss chard you eat, but when a beginning gardener comes in who's never gardened before, I want them to leave with a six pack of Swiss chard. Because you can actually sell it and grow it year round, first of all. It's a green that we can grow here in the summer, there aren't that many. If it's getting overgrown and woody, if it's aphids on or something, just take a sharp knife, cut it off three inches above the ground, throw that all away, let it flush out new growth, you're ready to go again. So it actually can be perennial in the garden and we plant it year round. And finally, someone asked about lettuce earlier. I will say that cool season vegetables, once you understand them, are very, very easy. Starting in September, October, we plant broccoli, cauliflower, kale, cabbage, uh, lettuce, things like that, Swiss chard. What we've done here is we've just taken a big container, make a big 
jammed it full of leaf lettuces, mostly romaine and, and then some of the other leafy types, put in some beets for greens, put in some Swiss chard, put it out where nature will water it. We water it for a while until the rains come, and you can pick off that all winter long. So the winter vegetables, once you understand the cycle, don't try and plant them when it's hot, don't try and plant them too late, uh, you'll actually do very, very well. Basically, we plant them September through about February. So you still have time to plant some of the cool season vegetables if you want to. So whenever I talk to any group, regardless of age, I always say that all plants need four things. And when I talk to kindergartners, I would ask them to give me examples. Someone always says animals, no matter what. But they don't need really animals. <laughs> they need air, light, water, and nutrients. And a good gardener is someone who knows how a cactus differs from a fern in those regards. You know, a cactus is full sun, fern is in the shade, some want more water, some less. They also may need protection from pests and from weather. And the other factor is that gardeners always try and grow things where we shouldn't be trying to grow them. My grandfather, who was an avid cactus gardener in Palm Springs in Pasadena, was very amused when he toured Scotland to see everybody there growing cactus because they were very obsessed with cactus and that's true a lot across a lot of Europe. They had to protect them from the cold and make sure they didn't get rained on. He just had a cactus garden out in the open, of course, in California. So they may need protection from pests and from the weather. Think about those things as you choose them. So know what you need to know is where we are. And this is the main point I want to talk about is the sunset zone versus the USDA zone. We are in sunset zone 14 in Davis, but you're in sunset zone 8 in Woodland. Now that's getting very specific. And Sacramento is zone 9. Uh, compared to the USDA <coughs> zone, we're all in USDA zone 9. USDA zones are just a measure of how cold it gets in the winter. We're in the same USDA zone as uh, wherever Disneyland is back east of Orlando. Florida, are we the same as Orlando? Well, in terms of how cold we get in the winter, we're basically the same. Uh, so that, that tells you the limitations of those zones as well. I'll get to a picture of our zone area a little bit shortly, but the delta breeze is the main thing that determines the difference between zone 14, 8, and 9. Low humidity, how many of you moved here from coastal areas? When you first moved here, I came here from La Jolla, California, and my first you know, summer, it was 10% humidity almost every day. That's pretty amazing. Chilling summer, something we'll talk about a little bit more. Warm autumns, one of the reasons I talk about apples a whole lot is because they're real thrilled about our very warm pattern through October, typically. Our soils tend to be high in clay, silt, or sand, depending on where you are. And at least for now, we have hard water. Water comes out of the ground, starting, I think, this year. Some of it will be coming from the Sacramento River, but not all season. So we'll have sort of a mix of water. And we have very predictable pest and disease cycles. The aphids will show up in March. I'll answer 100 questions about aphids in the first two weeks of March. Uh, we have certain summer pets problems. Snails come out when it's been raining. They don't come out when it's dry. Earwigs are a problem in late April and May, and they're done for the season. So once you know that, you don't freak out quite so much when you have a pet back. But we live in an area where with 800 chilling hours most years and enough chilling for deciduous things, we can grow all these wonderful deciduous crops. This is a picture I took in February, late February, in my almond orchard. So we have almonds blooming in February, but we can also grow citrus, which are subtropicals. I have had trouble figuring out any part of the world where you can grow as many different kinds of things as we can here. Because we have enough chilling, just the right kind of chilling. And, but we're not so cold that the subtropicals are out of the question. If I didn't live here, I'd probably live someplace like the Willamette Valley in Oregon, which has a lot of opportunities. No citrus up there, because it gets too cold in the winter. So this is our Great Valley. And this is the bypass, which uh, we put in so we wouldn't be underwater in wet winters. So uh, flooding history here, what <laughs> people are looking into. Uh, there's a great book, Brewer, up and down California, 1860 to 64. He arrived in Sacramento when they had 72 inches of rain in the summer. It had been raining all season, and Sacramento was an inland sea. There was uh, 30 miles of water standing in one direction, and 60 miles in another, the capital of camp. That couldn't happen again. Just give you one of those unlikely things to worry about. <laughs> we are in a river floodplain. What that really matters, though, is that it affects the soil where you are. You know, if it has been flooding here for millennia, as it has along Cooter Creek and Cache Creek and places like that, if you're closer to those creeks, you're going to have sandier soil. If you're further out, you're going to have siltier or even clay soil. So when you're looking to buy a house, you might want to look at your soil types. Mediterranean climate, which means it rains most winters, not the last four. Then dry summer, I don't remember never raining much at all between May and October. And then, of course, a mix of soil types. The summers are the thing that took a little getting used to as someone who grew up in La Jolla, but um, I did. And I find people 
exaggerate the heat and forget the mild part. Our average high temperature in July is about 92 degrees. That means there's a lot of days over 100 and a lot of days in the 80s. We remember the days over 100, we forget the days in the 80s. It's actually a very pleasant, balmy place to live. My daughter was in the Marine Corps and did three tours of duty in Iraq, and she was in Ramadi for three summers. So I kept on my laptop a little thing that said what the temperature was where she was. And it would be 115 to 120 degrees, but it only dropped down to 90 at night. And that's what the summers were like there. Here it drops down to 65 at night, 60 at night. Mom puts on a sweater because of the delta breeze coming in. So look at a 40, 45 degree temperature swing. It makes a big difference in how livable it is here. And I put cold wet winters. If you moved here from a colder climate, you may be laughing internally. <laughs> I never saw a frost before I moved up here. But the general range is that our first frost is around Thanksgiving, our last one is around Valentine's Day. They have happened later. I have a picture of frost in the first week of April. We've rarely seen it earlier, but typically the major frost period is December and January. And we don't get a whole lot out of that range. 1990, any of you live here? It was 16 degrees on my farm in Dixon that year. And we had a similar one in 1998. And those are the memorable things that take us out of our zone. Chilling hours, I only want to mention briefly because of what happened last year. Chilling hours are the number of hours between 32 and 45 degrees that deciduous trees like peaches need in order to go into and come out of dormancy, flower properly, and fruit. We normally get about 800. We average 800 to 900. Most of the fruit variety, you go into my nursery or boxwood nursery, the label will have 700 hours, 800 hours on it. And that's what that means. We get those here. But last year, right there, we only got 500 and something chilling hours. And California cherry crop was half of normal. Apricot crop was down. The pistachio growers thought they had a great harvest, and then when they got to process them, more than half the nuts were blanks, which is what happens to pistachio nuts when they have little chilling hours. So that happened also in 1995. So in the last 20 plus years, a couple of times chilling hours have dropped down below. I've projected out this year because we're well on track to have about 800 chilling hours this year. I'm getting a lot of questions about this because of what happened last year. People want to know, should I bet, buy Alberta peach it needs 700 chilling hours, or should I buy a low chilling hour peach? Well, depends on how much of a gambler you are. If it's only happened once in the last 25 years, I probably would stay with the good peach variety and not stick to not go to the low chill one. But this is on my site if you want to look at it, look at the different varieties, what they require. And I mentioned the soils. One thing I do run into is people think that we have adobe soils here or a hard pan. I don't know if any true hard pan anywhere on this side of the valley, that would be an impervious layer that simply doesn't drain. There are some regions, if you live in Binning Track, North Davis Meadows, some parts of East Woodland, uh, where the soil is very dense and doesn't drain real well. The key question is, can you dig a hole and fill it up with water and you go out tomorrow, has it evaporated a little bit or has it drained into the soil? Now that 24-hour test, I rarely run into a situation in Davis or Woodland where people don't have acceptable drainage. Uh, the groundwater is the fact that you want to grow things like blueberries. Uh, they lack uh, acidic soils and water, and they have very alkaline soils and water. So I won't be talking about blueberries today unless you have questions about them. But what we can grow is two whole seasons of vegetables. We grow herbs year-round. We grow almost every type of what they call stone fruit, the ones with a single pit that detaches from the center. We can grow all these Mediterranean fruits like pomegranates and figs. Of course, nuts grow very well here. Cane berries, which is our term in the industry for blackberries and boysenberries and all that crowd, with some exceptions. The citrus almost all do well here, with a very few exceptions. Many subtropicals, and of course, lots and lots of perennial flowers and things like that. So we have quite a range of things you can grow. There are a few things. I mentioned blueberries are acid-loving plants. Apples get worms. They're not real thrilled about our, you know, they, they need more chilling than we usually get. And then some things, like the Mexican lime, are damaged in most winters here. So those are things we have to stay away from. The one thing that I run into consistently with people growing vegetables in particular is they don't add enough fertilizer or fertilizer of some sort. Our soils typically don't have enough nitrogen naturally to grow a crop of vegetables. So you do probably need to add some kind of nitrogen. My father went out and bought manure every year. After he died, mom would call me and say, the vegetable garden's not doing as well as it used to. That's because dad went out and found the cheapest manure anywhere and put it out in the garden every year. Remember the year we got a dump truck load, mom? That was amazing. Uh, <laughs> incredibly well. The neighbors complained. Uh, that's a great way to go. If you happen to have a source tonight. 
We do run into a lot of things that seem to be deficient, like you'll see iron deficiency late in the season. Well, that's usually because of our water. It's not actually because it's deficient in those things. This is to show you the USDA zones, which show the, the country that we are here. That's where the same as parts of Texas and Florida. So you can see the limitations of that. But if you're looking at a plant in a nursery and it says zone 8, zone 9, it may be referring to just how cold hardy it is. Sunset, by comparison, that's the Bay Area. So we're 14 in Davis, and we're 8, which is just about the same. So Petaluma is very similar to Davis. Right, that's true. It gets hot there in the summertime. The Valley of the Moon, those areas, the valley between the, the, the mountains of the coast range are very similar to the Sacramento Valley. And the valley itself, that's the delta. And there we are in Davis. Look, you guys are up in zone 8. Well, that's because the delta breeze flushes in very reliably. One time during a heat wave, I drove from a talk in Woodland home to Dixon. And there was a 15 degree temperature difference between Woodland and Dixon as the Delta breeze would come in. When it's really hot, I like to look at the weather forecast in Fairfield to see what's going on there. If the wind is 20, 25 miles an hour in Fairfield coming our way, we know the Delta breeze will hit Davis about an hour later before it gets to Woodland. But the geography is such that it cools us off a little sooner than Woodland. Frankly, the way Woodland is growing, I think parts of Woodland are now in Southern 14. We call that North North Davis. <laughs> so if you want to make good garden soil, uh, it's the simplest thing in the world when you have clay or silty loam, you just add more organic material. We actually can make some of the best soil in the world here by growing cover crops, by adding compost, things like that, or getting a truckload of manure. This is just a quick illustration to show you the difference. That's a sand particle, think of a basketball. A silt particle, think of a tennis ball. And a clay particle, think of a marble. And I often, the only reason I show this is people often want to ask if they should add sand to clay soils to make them drain faster. What will actually happen is it'll all interlock and it'll have something resembling concrete. So don't <laughs> add sand to clay soils. That's really the takeaway from that. How about raised bed? Well, they have advantages and drawbacks. This is, uh, I sometimes sit in with Fred Hoffman, KFBK. This is his garden. Fred elevated a few years ago in the Brian soil that has drip irrigation. And when I talk to him about how he's watering, he has to put a lot of water onto these because it drains through the bed very quickly. So he, he does increase the amount of water you have to do on the plus side. They warm up earlier in the spring, so he can plant his tomatoes a couple weeks before I can. So they also organize the yard very nicely. People who are fastidious, if you've got a spouse who's more of an engineering nature and wants things to look tidy, it's a great way to go. It's also, by the way, a great way to change your water use from your lawn to a much lower water use. The fact is that a vegetable garden per square foot uses just as much water as your lawn per square foot. But you don't take out a thousand square feet of lawn and put in a thousand square foot canopy of vegetables. You take out a thousand square feet of lawn and put in paths, you know, your feet, and beds. So this area uses probably a third to a half less water than a comparable lawn area. So the talks I've been giving on converting to low water, absolutely, edibles, uh, fruit trees, and vegetable gardens can be part of the low water landscape. Square foot gardening is all the way back east, those little grids in here. I don't know where you live that a vegetable is going to stay in a square foot, but the uh, second garden is not going to here. Uh, for greens and things like that, this, this has been around for years. Mel Bartholomew came up with square foot gardening years ago. He has you make a careful grid. The soil in it is a combination of peat moss and vermiculite and compost which to me is going to need water at least daily here in the valley. So we can take this with a grain of salt. Uh, the advantage, one advantage, he's elevated once again, so it warms up earlier in the spring that you can plant earlier. Other than that, it's going to use more water. And again, it's a great project for kids to have a small defined area for a vegetable garden. This is a customer of mine who is an engineer, by the way. So I can probably tell. My grandfather was an engineer, so I know the mentality. He took out the backyard. And this is uh, one view of the backyard. His entire yard now produces edible. Again, I'm not expecting you all to do this. But I want to show you a couple of key principles here. There are paths, so there's not mud and weeds. He's irrigating with drip irrigation, so he's putting water exactly where it needs to be. He's got a big compost bin. He has a cool compost thermometer, and so he knows it's functioning. So everything that comes out of the garden goes through the grinder, goes back into the compost, and into the garden ultimately. And he actually grows in his back and front yard almost everything that he eats, which is really pretty amazing. Uh, part of what he's done, that hedge, those are citrus all in the back. This is to show you some ideas, but the paths I think are the key thing in the drip irrigation that you might take home out of this. These are his tomatoes early in the season. He's done what I and I highly recommend this. 
these stakes and I'm going to cage them up off the ground. It makes your life much, much easier. My children were 16 months apart, so there was a period when they were really hectic, when they were like two and three years old. We planted a garden, we planted 50 tomato plants that year, planning to stake them, but we didn't get around to it. So we also had about 40 by 50 tomato ground covers. <laughs> At any time, you could go in there and pick as many tomatoes as you want, but I no idea what varieties were with. So here's what he's done, he's done vertical. I use stages, I make out of concrete wire. I don't really care what you do, just something that gets them up off the ground and keeps them up off the ground and easy to stake. Here's his corn patch. This is an orderly man. My yard never looks like this. I've got a huge vegetable garden, but it looks a lot more chaotic than this. The reason I show this one, this is his former front lawn with low water plants. Really cool. I, he's picked, he did, just comes to nursery and picks out what he likes. That's pretty much the way he's done this. So there's interesting things like barberry and California native. But, but those are fruit trees down the middle and young citrus along the back. And those are on their own separate irrigation system. So he's getting food out of his front yard, which used to be a lawn. You can do this, and you can actually make it very attractive. This was a couple years ago. I'll try and get some pictures of it soon because it's really filled in beautifully. And again, they have a solid citrus edge. Right on the other side of the fence are fruit trees. You've got blueberries against the fence on the inside. So pretty amazing, highly productive backyard. This is great to be using as a privacy hedge. The fruit's just kind of a nice bonus. Uh, here he has cane berries. Now the key with cane berries, I have planted them without providing sufficient staking, so I have wildlife habitat. But if you want to actually get out the fruit, I strongly suggest going <laughs> vertical like that. And this is how he does his cucumbers. And again, I show this mainly so that you'll think when you decide to plant your vegetable garden, put a little effort in at the start of the season, get things up off the ground and accessible, or you'll be really frustrated. So that makes it easier because of prior planning. This is what it looks like first part of the season. This isn't complicated. We bottle this stuff with our local lumber yard. All right, I want to briefly talk about soil moisture. And the only reason I'm doing this is that um, most of the problems we see in the summer, and especially in the last two years with people being asked to conserve water, had to do with how people were watering. It got to the point that when we'd see another scorched leaf or another burnt plant, uh, we, we learned, I trained the staff to say, how are you watering? And sort of cheerfully, rather than, how are you watering? You know, up at the end, and they'll actually get volunteer an answer. And the range of what answers we got was phenomenal. Five minutes, three times a week. Twenty minutes, once a week. The <coughs> system. Um, people aren't watering deeply enough, and they're watering too often. That's probably the bottom line. If you aren't running a drip system for two to four hours, you're really not running it. it and, but you don't have to do that very often. You do it every seven to ten days, depending on your soil, and you'll be fine. Also, you don't need to start watering as early in the season as people do. This is complicated, but all it shows is that's our rainfall, so that's how plants use water. So obviously we have a problem in the summer. But we don't have to start giving them everything they need the summer right away. There's some water stored in the soil from at least a normal winter rain. And we've had, we're have getting normal rainfall this year, finally. So you really don't need to be all the way up to your full water usage until about June. And yet a lot of people just turn on their timer in March and turn it off in November if they remember to turn it off at all. I'd rather have you, if you're using a sprinkler timer, change it once a month. If you don't understand your sprinkler timer, that can be a real problem. It really is necessary to know your sprinkler system. So water slowly, deeply, infrequently. I thought about getting some bumper stickers printed up that say that. <laughs> slowly, deeply, infrequently. Distribution is a problem, little drippers here and there. If they don't run long enough, they aren't going to soak the whole root system. And really the question I keep asking is how long and how often. I water my young orchard, things I planted the last two to three years, for about four to six hours with a drip system that gives about four gallons per hour. And I do that about every seven to ten days. If that helps you with your own schedule, uh, we can talk more about that. Deep soaking once a week. Deep soaking every couple of weeks, depending on the age of this is, these are different ways you can water. There's two great irrigation supply stores here in Woodland that I send people to all the time. They can help you with this. This is how a dripper works. It's dripping by the hour, a gallon or two an hour at the base of the plant, whereas your sprinkler is sending out gallons per minute. So if you're converting from a lawn sprinkler to something like this, you've just done about a 60-fold change in the output. It's important to remember as you, as you design your system. The folks at these hardware stores can really help you with this. This may be easier. It's not as efficient, but it may be easier. See this going into a lot of orchards. Your landscaper may want to do this. That's great for the landscape part, you're never going to change. But it doesn't work real well for a vegetable garden or a fruit tree orchard because you'll be changing things around. 
but they make similar products that just are tape that you roll out that you can use as well. The key here is we need to water from May through October or else your garden isn't going to work. You need to water it deeply and slowly and you need to do it fairly infrequently. Any questions about that? Real quick. Okay. Um, vegetables tend to be pretty high water use early in the season. I want to emphasize the tiny plant that sticks the fertilizer in. It's the easiest thing in the world. I have a bag of all-purpose fertilizer, I have a trowel, I like that, it goes in each planting hole. That's all they get for the most part during the course of the season. And really, this is the key one, don't plant too early. This was going around on nursery blogs and Facebook pages. Those were frozen tomatoes in uh, one of the box stores back in February of last year. Those are icicles. Okay. <laughs> um, I go through this every year, and whenever the nursery does, we get people coming in. I've already had someone ask me when we're going to get tomato plants. Again, it's February, we had Groundhog Day yesterday. Uh, putting them in early is not advantageous, we could still have a frost. But more to the point, these are tomatoes, peppers are subtropical plants. They don't want to go into cold soil. So I put up a sign, I think I have it here. Um, there we go. This goes over my tomato display when they first come in. So basically, don't plant them now kind of unsell plants for a while. I don't really personally plant tomatoes until late. Don't rush the season. You gain nothing from doing it early. I don't plant peppers until May. If you want an absolute rule, watch the night temperatures. Uh, or Dan Pratt of Radio Fame in Sacramento used to tell you to put on some shorts if you're modest. Go outside and sit on the ground. And if you're uncomfortable, so would your tomato plants be. <laughs> what I do now, and my son and I will be doing this shortly, this is last year's picture, that's my, my Australian cattle out there. Sometime in February, we stretch a big tarp over the area and we weight it down. And by April, when it's time, when I pulled this back and all the frogs and mice and things are running off, which is why he was so excited, the grass and weeds are dead. You don't have to spray them with anything, you don't have to mow them, they're basically killed by the lack of light. It takes a few weeks, but if you do your tarp in February, by the actual time to plant tomatoes, the soil and the, the weeds are just perfect. By the way, that's the overgrown berry patch, a little further down there. Now, he enjoyed that too. So, I guess you can't really see that, but this is, these are tomato cages, six foot tall, held in place, planted in them, Looks sort of overdone at first, but I can tell you by August they're going up and out the top of that. So make sure that at the time of planting you put in something to hold them up off the ground. A tomato vine will grow 8 to 12 feet here if it's happy. Then it'll run it across the ground if it doesn't have any place up off the ground to go. I also want to emphasize again the virtues of smaller fruited types. Whenever a young couple comes in that's planting their first vegetable garden, I will make absolutely sure they walk out with a cherry tomato. Because you really can't go wrong with cherry tomatoes. Now this happens to be that Julia that I talked about earlier, that's another good one. But if they go out with a sun gold cherry tomato, I know they'll be happy. Even if they forget to water it every so often, it'll actually grow and produce for them. So smaller fruited types, the time from flower to fruit is only six weeks or so. Big fruited types take a lot longer. So I'm not saying don't grow big fruited tomatoes, but definitely plant, especially if you've got kids involved, plant one of the cherry tomatoes like sun gold, far and away the best selling cherry tomato. It's got rich flavor, it produces I would venture, I once kind of did a grid count on my about 500 fruit over the course of the summer. I uh, eat them right out there in the garden. People like them underripe, they like them fully ripe. But there's lots of other cherry tomatoes that are very good as well. But I just want to emphasize that if you're starting gardening with a child or a grandchild or a school project, make sure there's a cherry tomato in there. I don't happen to really like the yellow pear tomato. It's very mild flavored, but it produces about 600 fruit on the vine. And you really can't go wrong with them. Kids absolutely love them. They are, by the way, perfect for a slingshot. <laughs> <laughs> there are many hybrid tomatoes that are old standbys in the valley. This early girl does great. Early girl produces about 40 or 50 fruit for about that big. So 8 ounce to 10 ounce fruit, yeah. Two years in a row, I can't get the tomatoes to set. Now, that's an issue when we have hot temperatures when they're blooming. And uh, so it kind of depends on the timing. I had a lot of variable feedback this year. We had a fairly hot summer. It was about 15 days over around 100 degrees. It's important to know that tomato flowers at 90 degrees will mostly drop off without setting. And so if you have spells of that, especially if the plants were drought stressed, they're not going to set properly. We found a lot of cases we were talking about when they weren't watering deeply enough. Tomato roots go four feet or more deep. And so if you haven't given them enough moisture during a hot spell, they'll tend to abort the blooms. But the smaller fruited types, you've just got so many blooms to work with, it's less of an issue. Now, one of the reasons we don't sell at our nursery uh, certain varieties, by the way, brandy wine, beefsteak types, they, they're more heat sensitive. And so they tend to produce poorly even in a normal summer. 
others are more detailed. This is a woman that I like, really girl, very reliable. Uh, this is what it looks like in the mine. Make sure, the other reason I showed this, make sure that if you do buy a concrete bar, which is what I use for my cages, you get a six inch grid so you can actually get in there and pick the fruit easily, but there's probably 30 or 40 fruit inside that mine that I needed to get at. And uh, you want to be able, you want to have access to them. And there are lots of heirloom types that we can grow here. Uh, when I read on blogs and Facebook groups about the problems people have growing tomatoes everywhere else, I consider how incredibly fortunate we are. And we can grow 100 plus different varieties here that love the heat and dry in the summer so we don't get leaf diseases. This is one called Costaludo Genovese. The fruit are about this big, rich, meaty flavor. So I don't discourage you from planting some of these. But if you're coming in to buy five or six tomato plants, which should be enough to feed your family for the whole summer here, um, make sure you get one of these and a cherry tomato and a smaller fruit in time. Get a bunch of different kinds and try something new. Try a new heirloom type like this. What's yeah. the name of that tomato? Costoluto Genovese. Costoluto Genovese. <laughs> Obviously an Italian heirloom. So I, you know, I, have here, I get close details on my own tomato varieties and I get skunked every now and then. There's some varieties that I'll grow the vine and I'll get no fruit. I'm always trying some new ones. Uh, a lot of the heirlooms I like to grow because I get a lot of press, everybody's all excited about the heirloom tomatoes. You think about where heirlooms are from, they're mostly, say, Brandywine, Pennsylvania, or someplace in Ohio where the climate doesn't translate. But it's worth growing a big fruited one when you're going to get a 25 ounce tomato. It's <laughs> a <laughs> <laughs> uh, big, Zach, big Zach hybrid. Big Zach presently, I think, holds the record for the world's largest tomato. It's like uh, nine pounds. But, uh, I, I had 40 fruit on this vine. I think I have a picture of one day's harvest. 40 fruit that averaged 20 to 25 fruit. So there's a reason for doing this, not just to take pictures of it, but also to be able to show people what we can do here. This vine was 10 feet tall and produced about 40 fruit, and the smallest one was 20 ounces. And we have some amazing fruited varieties. This is one called persimmon that I grew this year for the first time. I've never heard of it before. All the fruit were over a pound, big, rich, meaty, sweet flavored ones. So try one. Try something new each year. Really recommend it. Um, all of what I said about tomatoes is even more true for peppers and eggplant. I don't plant peppers and eggplant until May. So first of all, I'm going to show you eggplant, and bear in mind it takes a long time to develop on the vine, and there's a whole lot of different kinds. This was taken at the heirloom festival put on by Baker Creek Gardens over at Baker Creek Nursery over in the uh, uh, it's just a range of eggplants. Don't even put them in the ground until May. And generally, if you like eggplant a lot, plant smaller fruited types to get more. I had a customer who was a student at Davis, uh, who stayed here for many years after that as a postdoc, who all she bought for me every summer was six six packs of eggplant. Mm -hmm. I said, that's a lot of eggplant, by the way. For like the third year, I said, that's a lot of eggplant. What do you do with this? And she started rattling off recipes. In the Middle East, they use eggplant you know, for two or three meals a day. They do produce very well here, and so she had an awful lot of eggplant to deal with. But not usually produce until late in the season. Don't plant early. They sulk if you put them in too early. If you like hot peppers, we can really grow them here. And if you like them moderately hot, just mildly hot for chili for I want to mention Anaheim, which is always my mother's favorite pepper. Uh, great for chili serrianos, also great for cooking with. Your family won't freak out about a, a significant amount of it in a recipe compared to, say, habanero, mucho, tia, some of the ones that are literally dangerous to grow. Um, if you really like a hot, hot pepper and you don't want something, I, I actually consider habaneros in that group kind of hazardous if you have toddlers or kids around. Because if they get it on their hand and their eye, it's going to really hurt. Um, cayenne pepper is hot. It's good and hot. It's very hot. But it's not dangerously hot. So it's a good one for this area if you want something to really get some heat. Um, Fresno is a good jalapeno type, developed from the valley, does extremely well here. Uh, this is uh, Italian long green, which people don't know real well. We call them frying peppers, which confuses people. We use them in recipes, yeah, they throw them in, they fry them on the grill. They're also very sweet and a great sweet pepper for this area. Italian long green. There are lots of colorful peppers that do very well here in the valley. The key with peppers, though, is to plant them late. Get them in in May. Lots of organic material when you plant them. Some kind of fertilizer at the time of planting, and water them evenly. Your tomatoes should not be watered the same as your peppers and eggplant. Tomatoes like deep watering every seven to ten days. Nothing else in your vegetable garden really likes that. Uh, peppers, if they go seven to ten days, the, the fruit will abort. You won't develop properly, but they need to be watered more often. So I will start everything together on my drip system. 
And then the one valve that goes to the tomatoes goes on a totally different cycle within about a month. This water about half as often, about twice as long. This is a typical green pepper <coughs> in September. So you leave them on the vine, the plant, they will color up. And if you're looking for regular old hot peppers for the valley, jalapeno and serrano. If you go to Mexico, most of the sauces on the table are serrano. Here in California, people like a slightly milder pepper, the jalapeno is very reliable here in the valley. This is a beautiful plant, this is high pepper, and I cut this in the second week of December. It occurred to me it had some great potential for holiday decoration. Uh, this is one plant of Thai pepper, and I just cut it and stuck it in the bucket and basically kept it that way. If you want to take that, flip it upside down, dry it in the garage, you can dry the pepper and dry it on the plant that way. It's, by the way, very hot. <laughs> just a few of the other vegetables, so you get a few pointers for each one. Green beans, I'm going to show you what the best way is to grow them if you really like green beans. Notice that's a large area being, being devoted to them, and they're all over it, and you have to pick them every day or else they stop producing. So if you're not that into green beans, bush beans are a better way to go. Because they make a single plant that produces 15 or 20 beans all at once, you pull it out when you're done. I like to plant bush beans around my tomatoes. By the time the tomatoes are getting big, the bush beans are done, and I can just pull them out at that point. Uh, corn is something to grow if you have kids. You absolutely should grow it at least once, but you need a lot of space for it. There's only a couple pointers I want to make for it. One, it, it, it needs room. Each plant takes about a foot of space and produces one stock, basically. So if you have a small garden, it's probably not the most efficient thing to do. But if you've ever had corn that you just picked and cooked, it's the most amazing thing in the world. Uh, the other thing is, this was pretty remarkable because there was no caterpillar eating the end of this one. <laughs> but I was beautiful when to take a picture of it. Corn earworm will happen here, you know, they get in, they, they eat the end. I actually carry it, I put me out in the garden, I just cut them out right there and put them back into the ground and carry the corn in. Uh, it's not getting further into the, the ear and it's not really doing any harm. So you just get used to it. There's sprays that are used commercially, you don't really need to do that. They don't penetrate that far into the plant. This is Silver Queen, which is still one of the most amazing white corn ground. Lots of water, lots of nitrogen, lots of space. So if you're limited for space, corn may not be the best thing to grow. But there are some really cool ones. Uh, there's some very ornamental ones. And if you've got kids in the household, you want to grow uh, the ornamental corn. They're really amazing. They actually do dry and grind and cornmeal as well. You just need to give, you know, also, this is very important, they're wind pollinated, not bee pollinated. So a straight row of corn, the pollen blows away and it goes to the ears. So you need to grow it in blocks so that the pollen will mix you down to the ears. Minimum four by four blocks. Cucumbers are really easy to grow and everyone almost always says, why are they so bitter? That's the first question I always get. And I say, you're growing the wrong ones. I don't grow regular green cucumbers ever anymore. I've given up on them completely. They're always bitter no matter what. You can look in all the, the references and they'll tell you that something to do with the way you're watering or something. No, they just get bitter here in the valley because it's hot is my conclusion. These are Persian cucumbers. That was one morning picking from four vines. And I continued picking from those four plus others all the way through September. So Persian cucumbers, lemon cucumbers, Armenian cucumbers, my son loves because they get huge. Burtless cucumbers, Japanese cucumbers all do well here and are rarely bitter. The regular green cucumbers are almost always bitter. So look for the Persian types, if you like a really sweet cucumber, or any of these others. I grew this for fun. Anything related to a cucumber does really well here, by the way. A friend of mine that imported some seed from Thailand, Guam, and Vietnam, all the same plant that's used in both medicinally and in soups. Any of you ever grown bitter melon? It's a very similar plant. Yeah, so if you want to grow anything in the cucumber melon family, if you love a hot, dry climate, here we are. I don't know what you're going to do with them. I just grew them and gave them to him. But uh, it's a very cool thing to grow. Very interesting. And the turn, by the way, this bright orange color when it was ripe. And when we opened it up, this gelatinous stuff came out. It would have been perfect for some Halloween party. <laughs> My garden always has melons because I have a huge amount of space. Melons take a large amount of room. So a single cantaloupe plant will cover an area 8 by 8 and produce probably 3, maybe 4 cantaloupes for you. If you're limited for space, they're not the first choice. But they're worth it. If you want to make one note about the best melon to grow, it's ambrosia cantaloupe. This is what I got from two 2 inch pots. $2.39 pots of pumpkin plants that it's stuck on the edge of the garden. When I'm done with everything else being planted, the system is in, I see spaces where there's still drippers happening, and I stick other things in there. But at the end of the garden, I planted two little pots of this regular jack-o'-lantern pumpkin 
September, I'm going to write, and this is what I had in October. That picked them a little early, but uh, this is what, I mean, and I didn't give them any extra attention. Again, they take a lot of space. I did have a guy, a little on 13 acres, who wanted to grow a giant pumpkin. Presently, the record is over 2,000 pounds. The world biggest pumpkin. He wanted to try and be in that competition. So I gave him half an acre. He planted, seriously, he planted, made two hills, planted on each hill, came down every day, drove from Woodland to my farm every day to water them carefully, gave them an entire bag of Scott's Miracle Grow. That was the course of the summer. They grew, I could almost, I swear I could see them grow, six inches a day. I measured it at one point to grow. They covered half an acre. The, the melon's got, four, our pumpkin's got 400 pounds of a heat wave. That's where they stopped growing. So all that stuff was true. But they do have a contest. They each have a nut tree periodically. 1,500 to 2,000 pound pumpkin are not unusual. The key to that, there's an article on my website if you're into this. It's all guys who do this, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you start with the right genetic material, give all this special attention, you water them a lot. If you want to read about it, there's an article on my website. <laughs> I also want to mention the off feed vegetables. You go into boxwood or our nursery right now, you'll find asparagus and artichokes and rhubarb and berries and things like that. Don't forget asparagus if you've got room for it. It's actually very easy to grow. It's a long-lived perennial. I have plants that are 25 years old now. As long as they drain reasonably well in the wintertime, water's not standing around the plant. And I just went out there. I didn't take this picture today, but I could have. I didn't realize it already started to shoot up. So they're, they're coming up. That's the main thing. You miss them if you don't happen to check on them every, every day or so during February. If you do miss them, they turn into these big, beautiful, ferny plants. So they're really quite cool. So if you have a big vegetable garden area, make one box for the perennial vegetables. Asparagus, artichokes, rhubarb is worth a try here. And just give it to them, get them watered with the other vegetables, and they'll do great. I do want to focus on herbs for a minute because herbs, if you're working especially with kids, when I deal with school gardens, I almost tell them to plant some culinary herbs and some permanent herbs, some perennial woody plants. For one thing, it ties in great to some of the other curriculum they're doing, healthy eating, things like that. One of the things that really sparked my kids' interest in cooking, and they're both very good cooks now in their 20s, is being able to go out and pick fresh herbs and, and know what to do with them. Know how to make spaghetti sauce from scratch. And they were amazed to learn none of their friends knew how to make spaghetti sauce. They thought it came out of a jar. Uh, so they actually knew that basil makes it taste good and you can chop it into other things. Herbs love sun, dry conditions, they're very drought tolerant, they love the heat that we have here, and they really don't require any special attention. Some of them, be careful where you plant them. Mint, for example, I use a ground cover on my acreage because it'll cover a single plant. In two cases, it's gone more than 10 feet, rooting as it goes. So mint, if you want it, is probably best in a container. On the other hand, rosemary is one of our common landscape plants here. We use it out in the landscape because of heat and drought power. Every winter, someone comes in and asks me, what is that blue flower shrub I'm seeing right now? It's right in actually January, they're blooming. And I'm racking my brain and see, no, is this really? I can't think it's rosemary. They bloom in the middle of the winter. Bees love them. And they're actually very drought tolerant. There's lots of different kinds. My home is a six foot variety called Tuscan Blue. There are prostrate types that cover the ground that are used in landscaping. Our breed of all star one is called Mozart, which is a very tight growing one, good for smaller spaces. All of them can be used as culinary herbs, but they vary a little bit in how pungent they are. So you might want to sample the leaves. It's a great plant for the landscape and for very low water landscapes as well. Common old kitchen sage. Very drought tolerant. Now, I have an old 1960s edition of Sunset Western Garden book, which under the genus Salvia had six entries. Now, under the genus Salvia, there's six pages of different salvia. And this is just one of them, Salvia officinalis. You start getting into the sages, there's a lot of ornamental kind. They all draw beneficial, they draw hummingbirds, they're great garden plants. And they're very drought tolerant. Basil comes in about 15 different forms readily available. Most of you probably want to grow sweet basil. If you have a container and you're limited for space, grow some little compact bush basils, which are great. Just bear in mind the plant lasts about two months. That's its natural cycle. At that point, it's flowering. It will draw lots of bees if you let it flower, so that's cool, but it'll kind of finish up and get unpalatable and die. Or you can keep cutting back to flush out new growth. What I do instead is just plant a new one every few weeks to get it to flush and give me new growth. That way I get basil from April all the way into December because it actually goes right up till frost here. And the last thing I do sometime in about November is whatever still doesn't have blooms on it, I go cut it off and I put it on cookie sheets and put it in the freezer. And I freeze it. It turns black so it's very unattractive but it smells and tastes like fresh basil. You can also dry it if you prefer. This is an easy way to do a herb garden. So this is your project for this weekend. You go out and buy a $49.99 oak 
whiskey barrel or wine barrel. Very important to drill holes in it. This is going to use it as a fish pond. So I usually do five holes with a one inch drill bit, and we do this for people, but it's very These are oak barrels that I got from the guy who picked them up in, in the, the wine country. Um, you put in a pot and soil on its desk. Every nursery has their own brand. I like E.B. Stone. Look on the label for some kind of fertilizer already in it. Miracle Grow Corporation has Miracle Grow fertilizer. It's a synthetic fertilizer. Yeah. All the other companies have, this has got bat guano in it. Bat guano is great. Pot growers love bat guano. It's like 9% nitrogen. <laughs> we like it too for herbs. Feather meal. These are sources of organic nitrogen, earthworm castings, things that will feed the plants all through the season for you. It takes about three cubic feet to fill that barrel. And they've added all this stuff that I talked about. And then uh, the other woman who works on it is great at putting these things together. Just took some of the herbs we have in stock. There's the rosemary. She grabbed some celery, because we happen to have it, a couple things of parsley, thyme, oregano. She asked if she could put mint in, and I said, no. And she <laughs> put in some sage, and uh, then went and got some flowers. Because flowers are fine with your herbs. And she got violas, because that's what you'll find in nurseries right now and filled in with that. And then went ahead and planted it all, and this all took less than an hour to put the whole thing together. And it was about $50 for the barrel, and that was $20 for the soil, and $30 or $40 for the plants. So for $100 or so, dollars, you have an herb garden that will produce year-round at this point. What we'll do, when we get into basil season, is we'll pull out the violas and we'll put basil in there. And if something gets overgrown, we'll cut it back. And when this little parsley blooms, which we'll probably do in late spring, we'll pull that out and put another parsley plant in. I had a customer in El Macero who had no place for a garden, which is kind of hard to imagine because they have <laughs> half acre parcels there. But she really didn't have a place to put a garden in, so she just bought a barrel for more than a decade. She grew all her kitchen herbs just in the barrel. Yeah? Yeah, I'll find the uh, checkout there. What's they that? Have a copy on display of the square foot garden. Yeah. You, uh, Herb, herbs would be great for that, actually. Much better than vegetables, <coughs> because herbs could stay there for a long, long time. We've really crowded it. I mean, a single rosemary plant would fill this barrel in three years. If you let it, and that's fine. If you let it, you know, if you lose it, your kid loses interest in gardening, you still got a rosemary plant. <laughs> but you can also just keep putting things in. In the winter, you can put in lettuce or, or kale or things like that. So it, the main thing, though, this holds three cubic feet of soil, so it's easy to water. Once a week, we'll probably water this very thoroughly. Now, that little bowl I showed you at the beginning is need water every single day in the summer and you're going to forget at some point, and you'll be demoralized about gardening. So when I ever talk about container gardening, the watering is job one, the bigger the better for the container, absolutely. The bigger it is, the better. The reason we use a milk barrel, that's a fairly economical way to get a large container. Someone was at Costco and found these giant plastic things that look just like clay pots. They're like 30 inch diameters for $20 or something like that. Asked me if they would work, yeah, it's great. It's a great price, and you'll have a large volume of soil as long as it has a drain. So that's what it looks like all done, and then probably three months from now it'll be spilling over with flowers and herbs to pick at any time of year. This is in full sun. You'll get some shade in the late summer as the season goes along, and that's really best for herbs. But if you're limited for, for sunlight, herbs are okay with a little more. All right, real quickly, the easiest fruit trees, because I know you don't all necessarily want to grow orchards, uh, but these are, in order, the ones that you just plant and wait. However, I don't think many of you are going to be using olives, so I'm not going to go into those in great detail. But we live in an area where figs, mulberries, olives, persimmons, pomegranates, and quince are things you just plant. A couple of years later, you're harvesting. You don't have to worry too much about it. If you go to my website, you'll see the other kinds of fruit trees. And my scale, my scale of how easy it is to get fruit to your table from a fruit tree, a particular type, ranging at one at the hardest, well, zero is in there. All the way up to five for the one who like the first time where it's planted and wait. You don't have to do anything except water it occasionally. I'm sorry to say that cherries are zeros because cherries, about five years ago, six years ago, started getting spotted wing drosophila, which is a fruit fly that gets in the fruit as it's ripening. And every cherry you buy now in the store has been sprayed three to five times as it was ripening to prevent those worms from getting into the fruit. It's become a horrible pest in the valley. And also, everywhere cherries are grown. I've been tracking this all across the country. And they have lots of things they do commercially to manage it, but I consider it an unmanageable pest for homeowners. Yeah? What about pomegranate? I don't see it. Pomegranate is not on that list. Well, they're on a better list. What would you give it? I'd give a five, because that's incredibly easy. Plant it and wait. 
Yeah, no, no care needed particularly. There's a test that showed up on it, but it's not a particular issue. So the cherry is only zero, and I know they're actually still selling cherry, but I want you to understand if you buy one, you have to spray a lot. So I put them in the definitely not easy category. But for example, mulberries, if you happen to like them, the only issue you have with those is keeping the birds off of them. Big, they already talked about. The ones that I want to mention briefly, apples and pears, I really like to try and grow them, but they will get worms, I guarantee it. And if you don't spray for the worms, it will get worse. So I don't consider them easy. I, they do grow here, and certain varieties do well, but they are pretty high maintenance tree. Citrus aren't on that list because they would be, be kind of a separate list, but they're very easy to grow in the valley, except that every 10 years or so we get a freeze it kind of defoliate them and sometimes kill them. They need a warm spot. It's really too early to plant them now. I want to plant them when it's warmer. Certain ones need frost protection. People tend to water them way too often. They're actually very drought tolerant. That landscape I showed you where he's used them in his front, he waters deeply with a drip system, and that works very well for them. And they'll, depending on the root stock they're on, they'll get bigger and bigger and bigger, so at some point you'll need to prune them if you want to get out the fruit, although many of them are quite decorative if you let them get big. And sometimes you need to fertilize them. I feed my young citrus for the first few years to get them well established, then I do it only if they show a deficiency. So that's where you talk to your nursery professional. This is a calamondin. <coughs> calamondin, people who from the Philippines come into my nursery and they get very excited when they see this to learn that it grows here. It's one of those little sour things, sort of like a kumquat that they use for juicing. This is a kumquat. Kumquats in the freeze of 1990 when they got 16 degrees on my farm, um, my navel orange was killed to the stump, and the whole citrus industry in Northern California was set back for three to five years. The fruit on my kumquat froze solid and fell to the ground, and that's all that happened. <laughs> Everything else was fine. It's by far the hardiest citrus there is that we grow in this area. And they're beautiful. They're very, very ornamental tree that has fruit on them all the time. If you don't happen to eat kumquats, then I wouldn't necessarily plant it. But it's actually very pretty just in its own right, even if you're not fond of the fruit. I mentioned the Meyer lemon. The regular lemons, the real lemon, Lisbon and Eureka, are big plants. You want dwarfing rootstock 10 to 15 feet, so they take some pruning to keep them under control. But if you want a lemon that's for lemon chiffon pie, that's the true lemon. I think that the biggest group in recent years, thanks to the incredible marketing program for the cuties and the halos, has been the mandarins. And they're selling clementine, murkot, and another one in that program. This is the original seedless, wonderful, incredible um, mandarin, which is the Owari Satsuma. If I only had room for two citrus, I would have a Washington navel and an Owari Satsuma mandarin. Here we pick them almost by Thanksgiving. My kids do go out there for nostalgic reasons and pick them. They're still kind of tart. By December, they're fully ripe. By January, they're done. So it's a short window on the Satsuma mandarin here. <coughs> Mine are all done at this point because all the rain has been spoiled. But they're sweet, seedless, easy to peel, and quite cold hardy. Might have gone down to 17 degrees without any problem. I don't recommend that, but they've done it. Now this is what the tree looks like. I took that picture last January. <coughs> so anybody can walk up and fill a bag with them, and then you'll pick out six, eight, ten grocery bags of fruit off of the 20 year old Hawaii Satsuma mandarin. That's not a slow growing rootstock, so these plants are over 20 years old. They're just hitting about seven to eight feet. And this is the density of the fruit that you get. Blood oranges grow here. I never sold blood oranges except for people who have been to Europe and people from Israel and the Mediterranean who, and the Middle East who knew them. Now people are beginning to catch on that blood oranges do well here. They're quite easy to grow here in the valley. This is the name orange. Don't forget it. It's the mainstay of citrus. Everybody takes it for granted. Mulberries. Have any of you ever had mulberries? How many have had mulberries? Okay, so more than usual. It's, they're catching on. Uh, this is the Russian mulberry that I have on my property. The plant's about 15 by 15. They I do something unusual. They flower and set fruit over about an eight-week period. So you can start picking them in June all the way into August. Except that by August, the birds are all over the trees. The birds are the biggest problem with mulberry. And the first time someone eats a mulberry, watch their facial expression because they're expecting a blackberry. It's nothing like it. It's sweet and musky and totally different. They're absolutely indestructible. The only issue with them really is the, the birds getting at the fruit. And the weeping mulberry is a white mulberry with a mild flavor. This was my kids' playhouse for about 10 years when they were young. I just cut the door into it. I recently found an old teddy bear in there that's been there for probably 17 years. And now it's my daughter. <laughs> they set these little fruit that are sweet and mild. The birds absolutely love them. So mulberries are unbelievably easy to grow. This is a weeping form that makes a great garden feature as well. They're very drought tolerant. 
Uh, for Sim, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of them, but I can't argue with them in terms of ease of cultivation. Basically, you plant them, you water them until they're established, about three to five years later, you start getting more fruit than you know what to do with. By far, the best selling one is the flat bottom Uyu, which is firm. You can, when you eat it, you can actually pick it off when it looks like this, and before it's turned goopy, and you can actually eat it that way. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> That's my Uyu for Simon on a particularly heavy crop year. Uh, the little boy in this picture is six foot five, and so we estimate that tree is 30 feet tall, and that particular was a pretty light crop here, it had about 500 fruit. Now, needless to say, I've never pruned this to get out the fruit, I just figure everything above that point is for the cedar waxwings and jays and other birds that enjoy them. So, and this gets watered once a month during the summer. This is the one that's got to be literally squishy soft before you can do anything with it, the hachia. That's an astringent type of persimmon, but it's prized for baking and cooking. It's got a very, very rich flavor. But it makes you hungry as before. I do want to mention one pest problem that showed up on them that's freaking people out. They don't need to freak out. It's the leaf wood bug, which is increasing in California because it's a pest on almonds, which are themselves increasing in California. And monograms actually become a pretty big crop in California, more than they ever were before. It's this big, strange looking bug with an appendage on the leg. So they're, they're sizable. Now, I have a picture, I didn't show it to you because it's gross. It's got about 50 of them on one fruit. All over it, just bugs all over this one fruit. And the person who took the picture said that was the only fruit on the tree that had any bugs on it. So they're not a huge problem for homeowners. They have a proboscis that is tough enough to poke in through the skin and get into the little juicy arrows in there, and they just kind of straw them out one by one. So if you open up the one that the 50 were on, some of the juicy parts wouldn't be any good. But it's not a huge problem on the rest of the tree. So I, commercially, they're dealing with them. I've had a lot of people bringing these in to me to ask me what they are. And it's one of these cases where I just say, just marvel at the phenomenon. Don't worry too much about it. <laughs> You've got plenty of pomegranates, right? <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, there's a whole lot of varieties. There are. There's over 100 in the germplasm of the body. Exactly. Yeah. Recommendations. Um, in the trade, there's about a half dozen. The most common red pomegranate is Wonderful. That's the name of the variety. And they're really wonderful in Grenada, which is naturally current sport of that ripens a little earlier. I think most people would like ever sweet because it's not as intense. It's got good flavor, but it's not as powerful as the wonderful. If you ever get a chance to get the pomegranate tasting on campus, I have not been there. Hundred and something varieties of pomegranates, an amazing range. They're out a, a plant from high desert mountain areas. Uh, they're extremely drought tolerant. <coughs> Uh, stone fruits, I mentioned them even though they're not considered easy, and I want to set your mind at ease a little bit about them. And that's my real also gem each, and it really it's worth growing no matter how much work you have to do it. Because you can walk up to that and pick, you know, 75 of the best peaches you'll ever have. Um, the key is, I have all of my fruit trees now pruned under 10 feet. I'll be 60 years old in December, I don't want to climb ladders anymore. Mm -hmm. So I basically train them low when they're young, you get low branching, and I go out in the summer and I cut off anything that's gotten too tall, or I have that six foot five sun, <coughs> a pair of whopper, and I don't really care where he's cutting, because I'll clean it up in the winter if need be. And then I thin them out a little bit, and I get a more open structure. This has a central leader, but I've also topped it down to keep the fruit within the 10 foot range. If you don't do that, I have one that I'll show you a picture of, which is this one, Red Baron, grown for the, the beautiful flowers as well as the high quality fruit. And I let it grow like a tree, and I train it very carefully, so it's about 15 by 15, and it rains fruit down on us because we can't possibly get it all picked in time. So a lot of it goes to waste, honestly, but it's a beautiful tree with worth growing for the flowers alone. It happens to have very good fruit as well, and it's a little chill variety. But this is really the way to grow them for access to the fruit. Low pruning from the start, you get, usually the second winter, take it down to the branch that's well positioned, keep it down. And that summer pruning has really become the key for homeowners. You can go out there in August or September and cut off what's gotten too tall. And it doesn't really take any horticultural skill. Any kid that lives in your household can do it, I guarantee you. So <laughs> you can put in their head and say, just hedge it across the top. Apples, whatever it is, because we've been doing this from the start. I'll come back in January and clean up the cuts if I have to. But he brings them down for size control. That way you're not having to deal with a lot of fruit out of reach. Uh, this is the blue one right here. It's actually quite worth it as a landscape plant. So this is a close-up of that real world. So gem with all the fruit within picking range. Now I haven't thinned this enough. You really should thin out the fruit as well. But you know, I can walk up and pick 50 or 60 fruit. I've kept this tree about eight by eight. But I really recommend you do that. Don't use commercial training and pruning techniques for fruit trees in your yard. 
Uh, you want to keep them small, you want to stun them so they don't get huge, and you want to reduce the fruit production. You want 50 or 100 fruit where the potential of that tree is 2,000. That's what they'll get off of a well-producing orchard peach. I don't know what you would do with 2,000 fruit. But there were This is boring. Boring is on my list of top 10 fruit flavored, top 10 flavored fruit. It's a very good all-purpose peach. And, you know, picking that at 7 p.m. on a hot summer day is definitely worth it. What was the name? Boring, L-O-R-I-N-G. Plums are often described as a beginner's fruit because, again, anybody can grow a plum. The thing is, you need to ask when you buy one, does this plum need a pollinizer? And some plums need a second kind of plum in the yard, others don't. So it's important to know that. So this is a really, really simple dessert that I had in August at one point. That single plums, black mission figs, everybody raved about it. I didn't have to do anything except pick them. That's about the easiest thing you have. This is a pluot. I want to mention pluots because they have caught on. Finally, Floyd Zager introduced it for 30 years ago, I think. The patent finally worn off. They are a cross between a plum and an apricot. And once they're producing, they're an astonishing fruit. Yeah. This is flavor. This is apple dandy. It's a little hard to tell when it's right. They don't become a commercial looking fruit because of the modeling and so on. They become really a popular home garden fruit. They do need the real takeaway from this. They grow just like a plum. They're very, very easy. Don't let them get too big. They ripen at different times depending on the variety. Every pluot needs another kind of pluot or a plum such as Santa Rosa to cross pollinize it. They're all self sterile. So if you buy a pluot, you should buy a Santa Rosa plum or the appropriate pluot to go with it. Showed you the cherries. This is what happens. The worms get in. It's really gross. It's full of wriggling larvae. It's disgusting. So I really recommend that. Over the years, I've had a lot of very curious things that people ask me about. and. Um, this is a, anybody know what this is? Usually someone in the audience knows this one. Here in the Thai cooking. Oh, yeah, sure. It's a kefir lime. Kefir lime. This is the fruit of the kefir lime, which you mostly grow over the foliage for Thai recipes. Very easy to grow here with a little frost tender. If you've ever grown your own saffron, saffron is a fall blooming bulb. It's a true crocus, crocus sativus. Easy to grow, the problem is finding the bulbs. They're not easy to get a hold of. They bloom in October and November. I planted six many years ago. And they paid for themselves the first year because just a handful of saffron was more of the cost of the bulbs. And for about eight years, they steadily increased and gave me more and more saffron. They were the sunniest, driest part of my garden was the key with saffron crocus. And also, what ultimately happened was they got to be so little, they just got overgrown and lost in something else. I didn't see anything about apricots. <laughs> That's true. We should come back to apricots in a moment. Uh, I'll do it right now. Apricots grow very well here but they're very prone to brown rot, which is a disease problem that gets worse and worse as the trees get older and older. Uh, and I've tried to sell resistant varieties where people want the lemon apricot, which is the best flavor one, but very susceptible to brown rot. So the key with that, just for your takeaway on this, open the habit so the air moves well through it so you don't get the disease problem. Any fruit that sticks and hangs in the tree needs to be pulled off so they hang through the winter, infect the following year, and prune them very carefully. Apricots do very well in their commercial crop in this area. But brown rot is something they either have to spray for or prune for or both. I'm going to put them on my high and easy. I think they get a three on my scale. Uh, pineapple guava, if you like them, I know you used to make chutney out of pineapple guava. Uh, my plant produces about 200 fruit every year, and I eat maybe 10 of them. But it's a shrub, it's a landscape shrub. It's very easy to grow, and then it happens to have edible fruit. Can you just I have two. That's important. I have, I have two different varieties. There's one that's self fruitful. If you really want to find out what well, there is self fruitful. By the way, the flowers are also edible and very sweet. Mm -hmm. Have you ever walked by a pineapple guava with a kid and have them taste the flower? You'll, you'll see the blue jays and mockingbirds stripping the blooms off, eating the flowers. used to drive my mother nuts. So they'd be eating the flowers before they could set fruit because they're very sweet and tasty. Hops. My son likes to make beer, so he asked me if we could grow hops. I said, well, you noticed on Interstate 80, hops do very well here in the valley. There's a whole hop yard that's gone in on I-80 right there at the uh, Kidwell, oh, that's Kidwell hop yard. Uh, they're actually growing, and that's an interesting operation. They're having volunteers who are helpful to the harvest. The reason hops kind of fizzled out in the valley is they're a very labor-intensive crop. And Fuelhauser has a great program. Yeah, they run periodically on California's Gold Rerun. So we did this the last functioning hop yard in South Sacramento somewhere, goes through the whole process. So I planted one, I actually planted five for my son. I put a big tomato cage in, this eight foot tomato cage. Hops, the only issue you need to know is they covered that tomato cage in the first season. 
and they ran all over the top and out. And then they, this is about a mid to late summer picture. He had great time harvesting them. He liked to make his own beer. That's kind of a trend these days. Hops do great here as long as they get plenty of water and have something to climb on. And be aware that you have planted a permanent plant in your yard. They spread by rhizomes to become mildly locally invasive is a term we like to use. <laughs> <laughs> Olives are very easy to grow but not easy to process, so I don't really think most of you are into that. If you are, I have a lot of information on that. Nurse me to shoot me an email, redwoodbarn at gmail.com. We can talk about olives. I planted 75 pecan trees because of the one that's on my property. And they are actually very easy to grow here. They're big, beautiful trees, 60, 70 feet tall. So I don't know how many of you have room for that. And they do get aphids, which drip a little bit, so that can be a nuisance. But they look like a big, graceful walnut tree. If you want to grow one, uh, be sure to get Western Schley. Just contact me about it, because that one is self-fruitful. I can't imagine a room for two or three pecans, much less you know, just one. So they're, they're a beautiful tree, take a lot of space, very drought tolerant once established and very productive in alternate years. I used to joke with my kids, you're going to have to go to college in alternate years because the pecan are going to be on that cycle. Um, <laughs> they're also kind of paying the harvest because they don't drop until late November, early December, so it tends to be a little muddy when you're picking them up. Yeah. How do you keep the squirrels out of your pecans? Well, they haven't found my farm in Dixon yet, so that's yeah. the answer. Um, and when they do, I may lose my pacifistic nature. Actually, one tree squirrel made it to my farm. I'm outside of Dixon, not far from the Seavers. And they're all through Davis now. I assume they're out there in the middle as well. Driving people crazy. They certainly are. Uh, yeah, they not a lot of easy answers. I would put barriers of some sort. It's really all I can think of. One tree squirrel made it to my property. Fortunately, one is not enough to establish a population. And apparently, it wasn't a female or pregnant. So I watched this poor squirrel go around. I'd see it in different trees over about a two month period. And we have all kinds of raptors on our property. And finally, I found it dead on the ground. If they do show up, barriers are what they do in the con country. Put flashing on the trunks to keep them from running up the tree. The ground squirrels enjoy them when they hit the ground. I have the best friend ground squirrels in the Slavic family. And that's a fairly typical harvest. You know, after that took me about 15 minutes to pick up five pounds of the kind. They say it's a squatting position. <coughs> Quince is actually something that people from the Mediterranean or Mexico get very excited when they see in my nursery. Now they're incredibly easy to grow here. It's low chili, you don't even need a cold winter for it. They're like a giant rock hard apple. But really, the only problem with people who grow them is figuring out exactly what to do with them because they are hard <coughs> and you have to cook them. Uh, they're using Scandinavian cooking. They just slice them and put them in their pork roast. They make jam, jelly, wine in Mexico from them. They grow very, very easily here. It's one of those just plant and wait plants. I want to show some. This one ornamental is called Chilean guava, Ugni molini. Little tiny fruit like this. Guava family. Smells like strawberries. When they came into the nursery with fruit on the staff all said, whoa, strawberry jam. It smells exactly like Smucker's jam. Now they have these cute little fruit on them. It's like that pineapple guava. It's an ornamental plant, but you happen to get a bonus of nice fruit. And my mother loved to make cactus syrup. Yeah, question. Do the guavas, will they grow in like a large pot? Yes. And that, you can yeah, you could do that. I think the Chilean guava is just a little shrub on the scale of, say, India hot corn. I also sell regular guava, the lemon and the uh, strawberry guava, which do grow here. They're on the edge of being hardy, so it's a little bit marginal in terms of cold hardiness, but they can be done. Um, we always had birthday fairs at our house in La Jolla, oddly enough, mm -hmm. and my mother always made syrup out of the fruit. She was trying to make jelly, but mom wasn't pure. She wouldn't use pectin. She thought the fruit should have enough natural pectin, so we never actually had this cactus syrup. <laughs> <laughs> so I, in her honor, when we moved up here, I planted a big plum, and I said, a huge Land. And uh, there's a lot of farm workers that come up and down my road, and I see them out there picking them off, carefully picking the spines out, eating the fruit right off the plant. Mm -hmm. And also, when they flush new growth in the spring and early summer, they pick that fruit up hollows. So it is got to be the easiest edible there. Yeah, that's why I always show it. Yeah, I don't literally don't do anything for this plant, mm -hmm. mostly just harvesting. I do want to mention briefly, with the time we have, uh, and then I'll take questions, planting flowers in your vegetable garden. A lot of people ask me about companion planting as a very formal, rigid thing where you just plant and this plant side by side. There's actually no scientific basis for the whole complicated companion planting formula. But having flowers in your vegetable garden is always good. Uh, this picture doesn't show the bee that was in the flower. That's not a honeybee, actually. That's a little stuck bee. That's one of the many native bees that we have here that does pollination for us. 
And so planting these nearby your vegetables and your, your fruit trees is actually a great thing to do. Having any of a number of flowers in the vegetable garden. I get people asking about marigolds because they think they're going to repel insects and they watch them get eaten by earwigs and clearly they haven't repelled insects. <laughs> but I suggest you just plant them in the cosmos, which draws butterflies and beneficials. I also have cosmos in my garden. This is hard to see, this is borage. Years ago, someone told me the borage attracts bees, and it certainly does. It absolutely attracts them. It's a beautiful blue color. It smells like cucumber, interestingly, but the leaf does. And it reseeds itself, so you only have to plant it once. Like sweet alyssum, another plant that's great in the garden. So it draws beneficials in. Just that kind of diversity is clearly good, even though the whole companion planting thing with all the chaos and you know, all the very carefully rigid formulas about carrots liking tomatoes and blah, blah, blah. That has no basis. But planting flowers in your garden is always a good thing. And I want to show you why they do that, because it draws beneficials in. I went out to take a picture of aphids for an article I was writing, and this is the backside of a mock orange leaf. And I found the aphid, and that was when I was taking a picture of it. After I looked at this macro photograph that I had done, I realized what I had here, and I sent it to an entomologist to tell me exactly what was going on. This one is parasitized. That one's healthy. This one's been parasitized by a little tiny wasp. It's overposited into it, it's younger in there, it's loaded, it's still alive, but not in very good shape. And it'll be dead soon, and the little babies will come out of it and go off and kill more aphids. Meanwhile, this guy doesn't realize it's about to be eaten by that. That's not a caterpillar, that's an aphid predator that is going to eat that aphid. And so on this one leaf, we have this whole ecosystem going on. <laughs> and the aphids are not going to be any better for it by the end of the sun. So the reason for planting the flowers and having the diversity, not spraying pesticides unnecessarily, leaving things like clover to let them bloom even though you grow them as cover crops, is to draw the beneficials that will do the natural pest control. If I have a plant and I'm not eating much of like Swiss chard, it's got aphids on it right now, uh, or in the summer typically, and I'm not eating it, I just leave them on there. Because actually I know that that has become a host, a nursery place for beneficial insects. I'll show you just one example of that. Look a little further here of uh, a case where we have ladybugs on a plant that I was about to pull out. Okay, I was going to pull this. It's a weed, it's a milkweed thing. Uh, not a milkweed, it's a, anyway, my family. Covered with aphids, so I was going to yank it and I realized what was going on. So why not just leave that on that part of the yard? Because I obviously have an established population of ladybugs in, in the process of taking care of my aphids for me. Okay, that leaves a little time for questions. I think we've hit the, the time allotted for this, so I will stop there. Yeah? What do you do with all your produce? Well, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, the almonds are sold commercially in walnuts and then they're sold yeah. commercially. Um, I, bring, I plant a lot of fruit trees and things just to see how they do and what kind of production I get. I feed about five different households. That's basically yeah. what I do with them. But I also bring them into the nursery and let people sample them. I've planted about 50 different varieties of fruit trees over the last two to three years, so I can bring samples in and people can say, wow, green gate plum, I want one of those, and then I'll sell them for tree. So I do it for marketing. I can write that on my advertising. Yeah. Do you have some favorite um, lettuce varieties? Uh, all, all the leafy lettuces, uh, the, the red leaf types in particular, do very well here. Uh, and romaine is good in the cool part of the season. Uh, lettuce, by the way, is grown typically in October through about February into March. It gets bitter if you get it into a hot weather. So that's the key thing. I don't do that. Yeah? Um, can you speak a little bit to uh, which um, plants that you would do seeds and ground? Oh, that actually, yes. Yeah. So, and when we do projects with kids, we, we discourage using a lot of seeds in the ground simply because there's such a high failure rate. But bigger things like beans can go right in the ground when the weather is, is good. Squash, melons, all those types of things. Corn can be, although I've taken to pre-germinating, basil is very easy to raise in the ground. In general, I find starting things from seed in the ground demoralizes people because of the loss rate. So I've even taken to doing things like California poppies and corn in cell packs and putting them out as quickly as possible. Basically, a good rule would be the larger the seed, the more likely it is to succeed in the ground. Yeah? I keep trying to grow tarragon every year, and mm -hmm. it seems not to like the heat. It actually should take the heat fine. It needs good drainage. And so that's one thing. It'll rot very readily. Of course, it's completely, the tarragon is a French tarragon, true tarragon, it's completely deciduous. So if you have it in your garden, it's not there right now. It would be bare. But I think the biggest issue with tarragon, when I've not done well with it, is because I haven't elevated it. If you're in a part of town with heavy soil, like the new parts of East Woodland or North Davis, 
you would need to elevate your beds, either raise beds or just crown up the area that the thing is planted. That's probably the issue in Fort Yeah? Um, for Thanksgiving, I was in Chico, and they had this avocado tree in the backyard, this really old like, picture of yeah. big avocado tree. They had the most amazing avocados, yeah. and it was completely hardy. There are some. There are some av avocados that you can grow here. I don't, I don't talk about them much because avocados are a little dicey here, but the Mexican avocados are usually hardy enough to grow in the valley. And up in Chico and also in Sacramento, there's a couple plants, the Duke avocado, which is not in the trade, but it is a hardy one, so that may be what you were seeing. It's the parent plant of some that I know people are growing around the Sacramento area. If you come to me for an avocado, we'll have a conversation, and then I'll talk to you about Mexicola, Stewart, Zutano, or Bacon which are hardy enough to grow here. I grew up with a Haas avocado in my backyard in Hoya, 40 feet across. Avocados were all over the kitchen counter all the time. And we don't grow them up here because they're too tender. So the Mexican avocados are what you're after. If you saw that big historic tree in Chico, it's probably the Duke avocado. And the only way you'll probably find that is at the California Rare Fruit Growers Association or something like that. If you have a question about obscure fruit, they're a great group. I have. California Rare Fruit Grove, CRFG. Yeah, for peaches. I love them, but they only good for three or four weeks when they come out. You well, Alberta's now. Alberta's regular Alberta peach is a July peach. There's early Alberta, there's late Alberta. So if you're a fan of Alberta, which is what we all grew up on it for a certain age, they were the California classic peach here in the valley. You can get four different varieties I can think of that'll stretch your season from early July into August. They're Alberta is more prone to leaf curl, and it's got some issues, but it's still the classic peach we compare every new variety to. But what happens is, as they grow orchards and orchards of trees, one will sport, it's just a natural mutation, the ripens earlier or later, so they'll propagate that one. And we now have at least four different Albertas that you can grow to stretch your season if that's one you want. And it's still, you know, it's the standard that we compare them all to. All right, I'll stick around for a few minutes afterwards and answer more questions. Thanks very much for coming out tonight.